hello students and uh, welcome to the 8.3 reading guide discussion uh, the beliefs of Christianity we've already learned about the origins of the faith and then this is how the faith ended up spreading and growing and influencing Europe uh, uh, during its existence so what happened was during the centuries after the death of Jesus Christians started gathering their writings uh, and then this is when the faith really started to develop when it sort of broke away from Judaism and uh, the writings, of course, centered around Jesus and the actions of Jesus and the belief that Christians have that Jesus is actually the Son of God. And so what the Christians started to do is they started to um, add to the Hebrew Bible, and uh, the Jews didn't accept these writings. And so this is where the you know the real disagreements start to occur between Christians and Jews. And um, this is where the, the, the branch of Judaism starts to split away and starts to be called Christianity because Jews aren't going to accept um, these writings as scripture. Um, again, remember that the Jewish people looked at Jesus as a prophet, looked at him as um, um, a really good teacher and someone who advanced the cause of Judaism, uh, but we're not looking at him as the son of God or as any type of Messiah or Savior. So Christians started referring to the old, to the Hebrew Bible itself as their religious text uh, known as the Old Testament. And then anything that they wrote in about Jesus um, was the New Testament. So Christians today, uh, the differentiation between the two is Old Testament is pretty much the Jewish Bible, Jewish religious text, and then New Test Testament has everything that deals with Jesus. So when was the New Testament, when were, was it written down? Well, somewhere between 50 CE and 150 CE. So you're looking at Jesus' death around 32, 33 CE. So, you know, somewhere around 15, 16 years after Jesus' death, um, these things were starting to be put together. And by the 300s, it began circulating through the Eastern Roman um, part of the Eastern part of the Roman Empire, mainly the Middle East and Greece. And although Jesus and his followers spoke a language called Aramaic, which was a common language in the Middle East at the time, uh, his, the New Testament was written down in Greek. Uh, the educated people in the Eastern part of the Roman Empire mainly spoke Greek, and the early Christians made a really good decision to write this. Uh, text in Greek because they realized they could reach more people and it was actually a really good idea uh, to write it in Greek. Oh, well, I kind of gave number five away. Why is it important that the first version was written in Greek? It's because it was the most widely spoken language in the eastern part of the empire. Then later on when it gets to uh, Rome, uh, you know, the western part of the Roman Empire, it gets translated to Latin. New, book, New Testament contains about 27 separate documents called books. The first four books are known as the New Testament, and they were compiled by four of Jesus' followers, known as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, the Latin word transla translation, um, Gospels, to English is, means good news. And so they are the first four books. And basically what they do, and this is something interesting, I think, uh, they end up describing, is this a highlighter? It sure is. They end up describing the life of Jesus in four different point from four different points of view so you might get the same story from um, one of Jesus's parables or an action that Jesus completed uh, you might get it's the same event but it's told from you know different points of view so uh, you know there's a Matthew version of the Last Supper uh, there's Mark's version of it Luke's version of it John's version of it or whatever and uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, being practicing, you know, Catholic Christian myself, uh, they rotate those, um, especially right around Easter time. They'll rotate, uh, you know, Matthew's version of uh, Jesus' last day on earth and then Mark's version and, and Luke's. And they all are, are slightly a little bit different um, because they're from their points of view, which I find, you know, pretty interesting. Or what are parables? And Jesus did use them all the time. They're basically religious stories with a moral or with a lesson. And uh, Jesus would tell these all the time. So it would be a story where you'd have to like really think about you know uh, you know the 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 answer and think about like what it means. And uh, you know then part of the teaching points would be for him or whoever the leader of the religious service is to explain why the parable is important. We'll look at more parables when we do the pair deck. It, Epistles are formal letters that um, those are these are the books after uh, the first four books, the Gospels, and basically they're formal letters that the uh, followers of Jesus and other early leaders wrote to the newly established churches, basically to explain church te teachings and to solve any problems. Paul wrote a ton of letters. Paul, um, you know, after his conversion to Christianity, really, I think out of any single person in the early part of Christianity, Paul is the most responsible for um, spreading the faith. Uh, and uh, he 
not only was Bacon converting the Gentiles, but he also uh, was pushing things such as the Trinity, uh, resurrection of Jesus, and how salvation works. So many, many of his letters um, are, are written down in religious texts, uh, letters to you know the Colossians, letters to the Hebrews, letters to um, this, the uh, you know the, um, the Samaritans, like all, all kinds of letters that Paul ends up writing uh, to different groups of people. All right, so Paul's life and early lives of early Christians are described in another book of the New Testament. It's called The Acts of the Apostles, um, and it's pretty much self-explanatory, things that the apostles did after Jesus died. And then the very last book of the New Testament is about the end of times. It's called the Book of Revelation, and it makes predictions about when the world will end. It makes predictions about um, when Jesus will return to earth and a final um, battle will take place, and then um, Christians believe that there will be a final judgment. Um, not only will the dead, the current dead, be resurrected, um, but there also there will be um, judgment um, between good and bad. So throughout the centuries, uh, Christians have disagreed about some basic parts of their faith. Uh, there's going to be a large split in the uh, Chris Christian faith. Somewhere around 1054, um, Eastern Christians and Western Christians couldn't get along. It was called the Great Schism. But they still share many basic beliefs. So there aren't, isn't just one version of Christianity, but all Christians believe the following, that Jesus was human. Um, and his death proved that he was human, and that Jesus was also divine, godlike. And um, Christians do believe that um, they will be rewarded with eternal or endless life in the presence of God um, if they, uh, you know, follow the Ten Commandments and if they um, are truly sorry for their sins. What the Christians believe about the soul, they believe everybody has one. It lives inside you somewhere, and when you die, the soul leaves your body. And what happens to that soul? basically depends on how a person lived. Uh, Christians do believe that God may forgive people who are truly sorry and if you choose to follow Jesus. And they also believe that Jesus provided eternal salvation to those who believe in him. Um, and this is kind of interesting because in the ancient world, like the people were really big on animal sacrifices to be either please the gods or to make up for the bad things that they had done to atone. And um, when Jesus is killed, many Christians connected the, him as uh, you know as a human sacrifice, as and the ultimate sacrifice as somebody um, who came down and willingly let you know this happened to him you know Christians will believe that you know Jesus knew that this was going to happen and and you know basically allowed it to happen because uh, it was for you know dying for the sake of humankind and the sake of um, you know for for the sins of humankind and so many Christians will have this connection the early Christians in particular and it made sense because back then they used to sacrifice animals and you know, sacrificing a human would obviously be you know a much more uh, you know a serious thing uh, and, uh, you know, especially what he meant to a lot of the uh, people that followed him. And so they thought that this was like the ultimate sacrifice and that it was done for a reason. Um, like Hinduism, you know, uh, Christians have, I guess, um, forms of God. Um, and in this case, you know, Christians still claim to be monotheistic, although they do believe that God manifests himself. Uh, it was a nice word that I was looking for there. Manifests himself in three forms called the Trinity. Uh, that'd be a good name for a character in a movie. If I was writing a movie, like a science fiction movie, about people that were like maybe in a Matrix, I think I would probably call one of the characters Trinity. Okay, so anyway, um, the Trinity for Christians are God the Father. Um, they believe that he created the universe, that Jesus is God's Son, but also God in human form, and that the Holy Spirit, sometimes called the Holy Ghost, um, allowed Christians to sense the presence of God on earth after Jesus was gone. Most of Jesus' teachings dealt with ethics. What are they? Well, they're issues of right and wrong and how to treat people. So, you know, if you, you know, have this internal feeling about how you should treat somebody and, um, you know, whether you should do something mean to somebody or you shouldn't, uh, you know, and, like, there's a little, like, thing inside you that stops you from doing it, uh, that's, you know, would be, you know, your version of uh, ethics and, and having the correct ethics. And usually those ethics, you know, not only come from your religious background, if applicable, or they come from your parents, you know, just the right and wrong way to treat somebody. Uh, Jesus showed great concern for the poor and the humble and even accepted those with uh, the lowest social standing among his followers. You know, people that were really looked down upon in the ancient world, uh, Jesus welcomed them. Um, adulterers, uh, prostitutes, um, tax collectors were considered really low social class and social standing among um, people that lived uh, in the Middle East. And uh, he, you know, his followers couldn't believe it 
that you know here Jesus was such an important person and he you know in their version stooped low to help these people find redemption and help these people you know find God or whatever and uh, it was shocking because you know people had not given this like class of people the time of day and um, here you've got this guy who's extremely important who is having m multiple like you know, large crowds follow him around he's spending time um, talking with people that would be considered outcasts Christians is, is the largest Christianity is the world's largest religious faith uh, about 2 billion uh, the largest branch is Roman Catholicism it makes up about 1.1 billion of that but Eastern Orthodox is a large branch large branch as well that split did happen in 1054 between these two we will talk about this in detail, it's known as the Great Schism, in which the Catholics and the Orthodox Church sort of split apart. Uh, there are some main Protestant denominations, although there are many, many more. These are the ones that have the most uh, adherents or believers, Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, and Episcopalians, although there are more uh, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, um, uh, Jehovah Witness. Uh, there are many, many other uh, versions of Christianity that aren't Catholic, and they are called Protestant denominations. The word Protestant, you can see this first part, the word is protest. Uh, we will talk about this at the end of the school year in June, and you'll be really happy because you'll be ready to become 8th graders, and you really won't um, care too much about 7th grade anymore. But we will talk about somebody who protested against the Catholic Church and made his own version of Christianity. A uh, very brave man, actually, his name is Martin Luther. And um, he starts a series of uh, branches of Christianity of these groups that broke away from the Christian Church, Christian Catholic Church at some point. Regardless of the different branches of Christianity, all Christians basically believe that Sunday is a special day of rest and prayer. They believe in Holy Communion or Eucharist, which is a ritual, uh, you know, symbolic, uh, you know, uh, partaking in what the Last Supper would have been between Jesus and his followers. Uh, many uh, Christians believe Christmas. Uh, all Christians believe that uh, celebrate Christmas, which is the birth of Jesus, and all Christians celebrate Easter, which they believe is the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus coming back to life. Um, it's interesting because Easter falls. Uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, in this version of Christianity, it falls on a different day than other Christians. Uh, it's only like a couple weeks later uh, that uh, Christians follow. Uh, they're on different calendars. That's the only reason why. All right, similarities exist between Judaism and Christianity. Um, I always like to think of the Jewish faith as like the big brothers and sisters of the Christians, um, and they're called Judeo-Christian traditions, which are still around today. And so here are the commonalities of the faiths. They worship both worship one God. Both look at the Hebrew Bible, which Christians would call the Old Testament, as absolute religious scripture. Uh, similar, eth similar ethical traditions on how to treat others. And uh, lastly, both uh, strong belief in the Ten Commandments as a way to um, get to heaven. All right, so Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, um, very famous speech that Jesus gave on page 330. Uh, there were a bunch of statements that you read there, uh, and you had to say which one was the most threatening to the Roman authorities. Here's the one I picked. Um, it's blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. And the reasoning behind my thinking is that land equals wealth and power in the ancient world, and that the people with wealth and power aren't interested in a change agent such as Jesus because they're already in charge. So I think they would be the most threatened um, since they were already at the top of the social and economic pyramid. So if someone's out there like claiming that the poor and the meek will inherit this land and I'm this rich and powerful fat cat landowner, I'm going to feel threatened for sure. And then Jesus has these large, humongous crowds following him who weren't violent at all. Um, Jesus encouraged nonviolence and actually turning the other cheek uh, when attacked or persecuted. But, um, you know, <laughs> these crowds could turn if Jesus wanted them to and become violent crowds and I think that um, the Romans and the officials that were in charge of these provinces in the Middle East would have had a lot of trouble on their hands and so I think that this is one of the reasons why you know people felt threatened um, by Jesus but you know guys this happens all throughout history change agents make people nervous and there's a large large list of them and you know them you know Gandhi um, Hannes Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., John F. Kennedy, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, um, uh, Robert Kennedy. Uh, we've talked about these people in detail, uh, people that are trying to change things, the Gracchus brothers, <laughs> trying to change things which they think are for the better and, um, you know, have their lives ended prematurely because uh, people didn't like the people in charge, <laughs> didn't want change. So that's it. 
appreciate you listening. Thanks so much. Bye.